Hey, and welcome to the highlights of episode number 139 with Dr. Frank Lippman. Some of my favorite parts of this episode were when he shares the good medicine mandala and the six keys for holistic health and happiness. I also love when he shares the four things we all need to be mindful of that could block us from experiencing epic health and happiness. But there is so much more wisdom and inspiration that you get in the full episode. So to listen to the full podcast and get all the info in the show notes, head to melissarambrosini.com forward slash 139 right now. Welcome, Frank. It is so great to have you on the show. Can you tell us a little bit about your story and how you got to where you are today? Because not many doctors have a holistic approach to health and wellness. So I would love to hear how you got to where you are today. Can you tell us your story? Sure. So I was born and raised in South Africa during apartheid. So I went to medical school in South Africa and I grew up in a very politically left family. And so I was always intrigued by African culture. And during my medical training or after I finished my training as a physician, I went to work in, in a hospital as an intern. And it was a black hospital because you either had to choose a black or a white hospital. And I, as I said, I was always intrigued by African and black culture. So I went to work in this hospital in the middle of Soweto, biggest hospital in Africa, actually, Baraguanas. And that was my first exposure to non-traditional medicine. And doing my internship and when we couldn't help the patients, the patient's family used to call in the Sangoma or the traditional healer. And I noticed that sometimes these patients that we couldn't help got better. After my my residence, my internship, I went to work in the bush for 18 months. As part of your army service, you could go work in these rural areas. So I spent 18 months in this rural area. And once again, I came in, in contact with these traditional healers, these Sangomas. And once again, I noticed that these traditional healers were helping patients that we couldn't help. And that sort of started piquing my interest. And, and when I finished working there, I worked in a white general practice. And after all these years, or what, two and a half, three years of working in hospitals where Western medicine is fantastic because Western medicine is hospital based medicine. You know, in, in Western medicine, we get trained in tri- crisis care. When you're acutely ill, when you break your bones, when you have a heart attack, when you burst your appendix. That's the medicine we all get trained in as physicians. And so that was the type of medicine I had was sort of practicing or I was exposed to working at the hospital and working in the bush. And when I came back into suburbia and people were coming in and they were tired and they couldn't poop and they were stressed out, and they couldn't sleep, I didn't know what to do because I wasn't trained to help these people. And I went to the doctor I was working with. I said, Paul, what the hell do I do with these patients? I mean, I'm not trained to treat these patients. I don't know what the hell to do. And I don't just want to give them drugs because, you know, that's, I don't think that's necessarily going to be helpful. And he said to me, Frank, don't worry. Most people get better in spite of the drugs that we give them. And your job is to listen to them and observe them and and support them and be there for them as they get better by themselves. And if sometimes when they need drugs, you give them drugs. But most of the time, most people get better without drugs. I started questioning my training because I had these two experiences where other types of medicine were helping the patients that we couldn't help. Then my wife and I didn't want to live under apartheid, so we decided we want to go work, go live in America. So I go to America and I had to get a I had to do three years in, a, in, in internal medicine to get a license in New York. And this hospital offered me a job because they liked South African doctors. You know, South African doctors were trained pretty well, sort of similar to Australian doctors, which was different to American medicine. So it was in an area in New York City that was burnt out at, at the time. And in, in, in those days, this is 1984, American doctors didn't want to work in these inner city areas. And the hospital could sponsor foreign graduates that they like for a green card. And and that's how I got into America. 
And I started doing my residency in internal medicine in the South Bronx in 1984, which was basically full of heroin and crack addicts. Basically got the job because Americans didn't want to work there. And after a few weeks of my residency, I said to my wife, I don't want to be a doctor in America because the medicine was very different to how I was trained in South Africa or how doctors are probably trained in Australia or were trained in those days. We were taught to take a really good history, do an examination and sort of make a diagnosis. We didn't have all the money to do all these expensive tests all the time. Whereas in America, you didn't really have time to take a history or examine patients properly. You had to do all the blood tests, do the x-rays, do the EKG, go study what it was all about and present the patient to the professor the next day. And this wasn't what I wanted to do. And I said to my wife, I don't want to be a doctor here. And I'd heard about this acupuncture clinic, which was doing drug detox for heroin and crack addicts, which was attached to the hospital. And the doctor that I worked with in Johannesburg, sort of when I left, gave me a book called The Barefoot Doctor's Manual. And he said, because I was starting to get into homeopathy. And he said, I'm not sure about homeopathy, Frank, but, you know, if you're in America, if you're exposed to acupuncture, you should go study acupuncture. So it was all synchronicity, and there happened to be this acupuncture clinic attached to the hospital. So I walked to this acupuncture clinic, and I walked in, and I saw 50 heroin addicts sitting quietly with needles in their ears. And I went, holy shit, this is interesting. These were the same type of patients that were really hard to treat in the hospital wards. They were pulling out their IVs. They were swearing at you. They wouldn't calm down. And I walk into this burnt-out building, and here 50 of them are sitting quietly with needles in their ears. So I thought, well, this is interesting. And I went up to the guy who ran the clinic, and I introduced myself, and I said, listen, I'm a doctor at doing a residency here, but I'm really intrigued by acupuncture, and I'd like to come and hang out here and learn more. And he was blown away that a doctor would actually be interested. You know, you've got to remember this is 1984. This is before, you know, now in America – this has become quite popular. I'm not sure about Australia, but America is popular. But 84 is 34 years ago, you know. So he was so happy that a doctor was interested. He said, absolutely, you can come work here and study here whenever you want. So for the next three years of my residency, I started living two lives. I would continue doing my residency at the hospital where I saw acutely ill patients and I was taught in Western medicine, and I was taught to see the, the, the body as a machine. And if a part was broken, you would either take it out or try to fix that part. And then in my free time, I'd go to the acupuncture clinic, and I was taught to see the body like a garden. So it was pretty obvious 34 years ago to me that the future of medicine would be some type of combination of what I was learning, that Western medicine would be You'd use Western medicine when people, when people were acutely ill, but when they weren't acutely ill or when they had chronic problems and before they got acutely ill, you'd use Chinese medicine. So that was 1984, 85, 86, and I knew that, that my training was limited and I knew that if I really wanted to help patients going forward, that I would have to explore other modalities. So I started with the Chinese medicine and from there, I, I got into nutrition and meditation and all sorts of things. So it was, it's just been a long journey, and that's a long story, but that's how it all happened. It just happened. I never sort of sorted out. It just sort of fell into my lap. For those that don't know what the Good Medicine Mandala is, can you please explain it? And can you explain in depth what your six rings are? So can we go into depth on those two things? Sure. A mandala in Tibetan philosophy is often used as a sort of a, a meditation. It's, it encompasses everything. It's a sacred, something sacred that I have, for anyone who's ever been to my office in New York, I have mandalas everywhere in my homes. I have mandalas. So I've, mandalas are always found to be a, a sort of point of reference, a point of meditation. So I thought, as I'm a huge believer in the person, the patient being their own doctor and taking control of their own health, 
I thought I would use a mandala as my basis for someone using these concepts to meditate on and to think about to become their own doctors. And so the mandala has this focal point, which is you, the patient, the reader in the center, and it's surrounded by these six rings. And the six rings are what I think are the keys to someone getting healthy and well. And my six keys, and you know, you could have four keys, you can have eight keys, you can divide into whatever you want. But I thought the six keys for me are how to eat, how to sleep, how to move, how to protect oneself from all the chemicals out there, how to relax or unwind, and how to connect, how to connect with yourself, with your community and with the earth that in the world at large. So I broke my concepts into these six basic rings. And within each ring, I have about anywhere from 10 to 25 tips. So it was just a structure that I thought people could relate to, could meditate on, and could use as a basis to start thinking about how they can take control of their own health. Could you give us one tip from each of the six rings? So one of my tips is to learn about your carbohydrate sensitivity because a lot of people, especially most of us who get older, need to probably cut back on their carbs and and, and focus more on a low-carb diet. And we're finding more and more, more and more research is sort of confirming that, for instance, Alzheimer's is sometimes being called diabetes 3. So a low-carb diet can help your brain. A low-carb diet can help many parts of your body. But Alzheimer's, if you worry about your brain, you know, eating a low-carb diet is important. So one of the tips is learning your carbohydrate sensitivities because you may be more sensitive to carbohydrates than you realize or how you metabolize carbohydrates is very important. Some people are fine. For instance, my wife can metabolize carbohydrates much better than I do. So if I eat too many carbohydrates, I'll start putting on weight. My skin won't be as clear. I'll start becoming more puffy. My blood sugar numbers go up. Could you give us a tip for the next ring, which was sleep? What's one tip for that? Sure. Sure. Well, let's talk about the glymphatic system. The glymphatic system is a system in the brain that only works when you sleep. So it's like a cleaning crew that comes around only when you sleep. So the the metaphor, I don't know if I use it in the book, but the metaphor I use with my patients is if you have a party at one night and you wake up in the morning, you haven't cleaned up, your living room is a mess. And if you don't clean it up, and you have a party the next night, your living room becomes more of a mess. And this you know, adds up and adds up. And after a week, your, your living room will really be a mess. And that's what's happening in the brain. If you don't sleep, there's a system called the glymphatic system, this cleaning crew that cleans up all the waste products, the breakdown particles of the protein and the nutrients you've been using during the day, and it cleans it up at night. And if you're not sleeping, that cleaning crew is not cleaning up all those waste products. So over time, those waste products build up and can, can lead to foggy thinking and eventually, you know, once again, things like Alzheimer's disease. So they're all different tips on getting a better sleep, but the importance of sleep, you know, we, we take sleep for granted and it's probably as important, if not more important, than how you eat. Now, what about move? What is one thing that we could do for the move ring in the medicine mandala? So we all have this fascia that runs throughout the body that surrounds the muscles, that connects the muscles, you know, to tendons and ligaments and connects the muscles to one another. And this fascia often gets tightened. So often when we have an injury and it doesn't heal properly, you get thickening of the fascia when you sprain your ankle and you don't treat it properly, the fascia tightens. And when you have tight fascia, a lot of back pain starts with tight fascia. It could be in the hips, it could be the upper back. So when you have tight fascia, it can cause all sorts of problems. So the fascia, you know, the, the vessels, the nerves run through the fascia. And when you have tight fascia, not only do you get tight muscles, but it can press on the lymphatics, it can press on the nerves, it can press on the blood vessels as well. So 
One of the tips is releasing your fascia. Let's go to the protect ring. What is one thing that we can do to protect ourselves? And what do you mean by that? Right, so protect ourselves, unfortunately, has to become a ring because we're exposed to so many chemicals in this day and age, in the food that we eat, in the water we drink, in the chemicals or the cosmetics we put on our skin. Unless you're very, very aware you're getting chemicals in your food all the time and you're getting chemicals in what your food is, you know, your food containers, you're getting chemicals with what you're cooking your food with. Your water has hundreds of chemicals unless it's filtered. And then, you know, if you want one point, I think people need to be aware of the cosmetics they put on their skin. Ultimately, you should be able to eat your cosmetics. Now let's move to the relax ring. What is one tip for that? Maybe we should talk about music or using sound for your healing. As I say in the book, you know, the daily actions you take, the ordinary things you do on a daily basis have extraordinary healing effects. And music is one of those ordinary things that we take for granted and can really be used for healing, not only to help you relax, but for many other things. So, you know, use music. You can use music to uplift you. If you're feeling down, you can use music to relax. You know, the classic example I always use is Bob Marley or reggae beats at about 60 beats a minute, which is like a a slow heart. And if you put on reggae and just get caught in the rhythm, then your body and your rhythms entrain to that external rhythm and you slow down. The next ring is about connect. Can you tell us about this and what is your best tip for this one? Well, connect is, is really about connecting to yourself, but also to your community and to the earth at large. So probably the easiest and a really important one would be find your tribe. How do we do that? Well, it's in a way easier with the internet now because you can find groups that you relate to. But you know, in the old days, it used to be your local church or religious community. It can be your yoga class, your meditation class. I think it's really important to surround yourself or be able to be around, not always because that may not be possible, but to be around people that you feel comfortable with that sort of have similar beliefs to you, you feel supported by, and you know they're going to be there for you when you need them. What are the four directions you say everyone should be aware of? Well, the four directions, I mean, I I had to use four. I think you know, what are the four key underlying dysfunctions? You know, when you think of what are four important aspects of one's health, the ones I've put in are finding balance, getting into rhythm. I'm a big believer in we as humans are a microcosm of the macrocosm, the earth around us. And when you start living out of rhythm, as this microcosm with this macrocosm, you start creating problems. So inflammation is another one. You know, inflammation is one of those key underlying aspects of health that I think most people are now starting to understand. So many of our problems start with inflammation. You know, I talked about rhythm. I talked about balance. I talked about inflammation. And I had to put the microbiome in there because we're now learning how important the microbiome is. We've learned in the last 20 or 30 years that we have these trillions of bacteria in our gut. You know, we actually have more bacteria in our gut than cells in our body. And most of these bacteria in our gut are actually good guys. They're, they're providing a lot of important functions, not only breaking down foods, but making hormones, vitamins making these neurotransmitters. You talked about, you know, your gut can make you feel happy. 70% of your happy chemical serotonin is actually made in your gut. In fact, all the neurochemicals that are made in the brain are actually made in the gut. So keeping your gut healthy and, and keeping your microbiome balanced is really important, not only for your physical health, but for your mental health. 